here we go. Welcome, everybody, to a new year of The Big Idea. What is The Big Idea? This is where we're going to be talking about some very big, very important research that's out there, but trying then to break it down into its tiny pieces so that we can better understand it for two groups of people. Number one, healthcare practitioners who should probably know this information. But number two, and arguably more important, for people who are experiencing the health kind of issues here, and this is going to be able to help them find the care that they are looking for. And this one here, this is a big idea, this particular article we're going to be looking at, uh, this one. I've been looking forward to doing this one for quite a while. The challenge is going to be trying to keep it in a relatively short period of time. Chronic neck pain making the connection between capsular ligament laxity and cervical instability. Now, in talking about this one here, I'm actually going to preface and let everybody know that this is actually an article that's written about prolotherapy. What is prolotherapy? Prolotherapy is a musculoskeletal procedure where an injection is made into various ligaments to just irritate it just a little bit. It's not pathological or anything like that, but that little bit of irritation helps for ligaments to tighten and over a period of time allow the body to better be able to heal. So in this particular ar ar article, I need everybody to know first and foremost that this article is written as if from the perspective of prolotherapy. Nevertheless, I completely agree with all of the anatomy review that they do in the beginning. Super important. But towards the end, I'm actually going to disagree just a little bit with their conclusion. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with this one. So per always, let's go ahead. Let's jump into it. Here we go. The use of conventional modalities for chronic neck pain remains debatable, primarily because most treatments have had limited success. So we conducted a review of the literature published up to December 2013 on the diagnostic and treatment modalities of disorders related to chronic neck pain and concluded that despite providing temporary relief of symptoms, these treatments did not address the specific problems of healing and are not likely to offer long-term cures. The objective of this narrative review, then, is to provide an overview of chronic neck pain as it relates to cervical instability, to describe the anatomical features of the cervical spine, and the impact of capsular ligament laxity. Chronic neck pain often reflects a state of instability in the cervical spine and is a co symptom common to a number of conditions described herein, including disc herniation, cervical spondylosis, aka degenerative arthritis, whiplash injury and whiplash-associated disorders, post-concussion syndrome, vertebrobasilar insufficiency, which is lack of blood flow going up to your brain, and Barry Liu syndrome, which is disruption of blood flow and of um, sympathetic nerves that when you move your head, same thing causes you to become uh, vertigo or dizzy. When the capsular ligaments are injured, they become elongated and exhibit laxity, which causes excessive movement of the cervical vertebra. In the upper cervical spine, this can cause a number of other symptoms, including, but not limited to, nerve irritation and vertebrobasilar insufficiency with associated vertigo, tinnitus, dizziness, facial pain, arm pain, and migraine headaches. I've talked about this a lot. You're not hearing it from me. This is what the authors are saying. In the lower cervical spine, this can cause muscle spasms, crepitation, which is clicking or cracking, and or paresthesia, tingling down into the hands and fingers, in addition to chronic neck pain. In either case, the presence of excessive motion between two adjacent cervical vertebra, and these associated symptoms is described as cervical instability. I'm going to read that again because this is going to be important for our whole conversation here. The presence of excessive motion, too much motion between two adjacent vertebra in the neck, this is how they are going to be describing cervical instability. We propose that in many cases of chronic neck pain, the cause may be an underlying joint instability, too much motion, due to capsular ligament laxity. 
Now, you guys know I don't read these whole articles, but in that summary, in the abstract right there, there really is. There is a wealth of interest. There is such a good, such a well-written summary with so much going on in there. So first and foremost, what are the authors talking about here? They're saying first and foremost that neck pain is super duper common. But unfortunately, so many different treatments really only offer temporary resolutions. And they talk about looking at, you know, exercises, and that's going to be stretching exercises and strengthening exercises and relaxation exercises. And throughout the course of this article, then, they look at the mixed results that you see with a number of different approaches. It's going to include physical therapy. This is going to include chiropractic. This is going to include acupuncture. This is going to include medicine. This is also going to include surgery. And point being, then, is that if you are trying to treat the neck pain, the pain, of course, being a symptom, being an effect, not necessarily the true cause, you may not actually get to resolving what that true underlying issue is. Now, even when people experience, you know, neck pain, they can feel, okay, very, very severe. I say this often, you know, you don't ever wish low back pain or sciatic on anybody. But if you got neck pain, if you've got headaches, if you've got vertigo or dizziness, that is not something that you can mentally block out. It takes an extremely strong individual to function when they have these things going on. So the prevalence of neck pain in the general population, somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. For some reason, women over the age of 50 make up that largest portion. Honestly, we don't know why. So it can have just a little bit of an effect or it can have, uh, as we said, you know, quite a massive effect. And so what they do is they have a look through the rest of this article then to say, okay, well, if we know that neck pain, it's a problem. It's a big problem, and it can be associated with a lot of other neurological conditions. We'll talk about those a little bit later. It's probably worth having a look at the architecture of what's actually going on here. And that's going to be a little bit of the review. Unfortunately, we've got the model here that's going to be able to help out. Just for a little bit of orientation, this is a three times too big version of the upper part of your neck forward facing. So this is the front, this is the back, and this would be as if looking top down through the opening about where your brain and your spinal cord live right here. So despite having the smallest vertebral bodies, the cervical spine is the most mobile segment of the entire spine and must support a high degree of movement. Consequently, it is highly unreliant on ligamentous tissue for stabilizing the neck and spinal column, as well as for controlling normal joint motion. As a result, the cervical spine is highly susceptible to injury. You've probably heard and you're, you're familiar with the idea that, okay, you have a vertebral column. It's kind of important to take care of it. And between each of those bones, you have discs. Discs are ligaments, and they are similar consistency to the tires on your car. In other words, they don't just pop, they don't just bulge, but they can erode over a long period of time. Now, the thing about it, from this level on down, yes, you still can injure those, but they are far more rigid. Your neck, on the other hand, your neck is designed to be flexible. So as you go up in height, the vertebrae keep getting smaller and smaller. In fact, when you get all the way up to the top, the level of your skull with that C1 vertebra, if you were to come one finger underneath of your skull, it's the smallest vertebrae in your spine, and it actually is responsible for 50% of your entire head and neck movement. The rest of the 50% is shared among all the other vertebrae. The reason for it is because the C1 up at the very top actually has no disc. It's the only segment in the entire spinal column. Doesn't have a disc above, doesn't have a disc below. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to be able to move your head. Now, here's the thing. 
It's that the trade-off is because that Atlas vertebra doesn't have a disc and it is the most flexible, it means it's also the most susceptible to injury. And that's injury of any kind and variety that you can think of. So not just injuries to the head, injuries to the neck, whiplash accidents, but also slips, falls, even where you may land on your tailbone. That force will go to the weakest link in the chain. And because this area is so important for balancing the weight of your head, if it ends up being injured, it's going to produce a shift that it changes the entire rest of your spine, the muscles and the ligaments. And it can also impart direct tension on the nerves right in this area, which only control every function in your body. So point being here is by its architecture, this area is supremely important, but is also susceptible to injury of all kinds and all varieties. So let's go down a little bit. So what is it that ultimately holds your vertebra in your neck in place? Ligaments. Ligaments that are going to be like a series of suspension cables, in addition to discs, multiple ligaments, and the two synovial joints of each pair of adjacent vertebra, aka facet joints, allow for controlled, fully three-dimensional motions. Capsular ligaments wrap around each facet joint with help to maintain stability during neck rotation. Okay, so we know about the discs, but the unit of motion that actually allows the things in your neck to be able to move, these are what are called facet joints. So I illustrate them that when we're talking about up at the very top, it's at this intersection here, which allows your hip to be able to move like that. When we go lower down, these are gonna be on the back sides of the vertebra, something like that, and that allows them to shift and pivot like that. Think of them, if you would, like a little fluid-filled compartment. So the insides of the joints are filled with fluid and then they are bound by this outer coating that protects that inner fluid and allows and gives it a certain normal degree and range of motion, something not on like this. And that is normal. Now ligaments, whether they're in your neck or whether they're in your ankle, yeah, they are supposed to provide stability and they're supposed to be flexible, but guess what? They can also be injured. So if you ever rolled an ankle, maybe not where it's gone black and blue, although certainly if you've done that, you definitely understand the nature of problem. But again, you've had an injury and what it's done is it's stretched, if not torn, some of those ligament fibers. What happens then is the area swells and it also changes the way that things are allowed to move. So let's say that you've rolled your ankle something like this. If you try walking on it like that, it's going to hurt you an awful lot because of the swelling. And you have to put your foot up and you have to rest it and you have to ice it and you have to compress it and you have to elevate it. You have to do all that sort of stuff until the injury actually heals. But if and when you've ever injured your ankle severe enough, you may have noticed that on the other side of that injury, it didn't quite move the exact same way that it was before. And the reason for this is because inside of those joints, there are what are called synovial folds and meniscoids. They're little bits of connective tissue that help the joints to glide smoothly. And if and when you've ever had some kind of a jarring injury, it's very possible that those ligaments can become deranged. That is, they heal, but they don't necessarily heal in the exact same shape that they were before. And the consequence of that is that the joint may not move exactly the same way that it did before either. Now that's going to be important a little bit later on. Now, you might be wondering at this point, okay, well, how do you know that this is the case? You can see evidence for it, you know, in terms of doing range of motion studies. You can sometimes see it at least on the correct kinds of imaging. But a huge chunk of the time, and this is my point, is that these problems go undiagnosed. People have car accidents and whiplash injuries and concussions and slips and falls. But the presumption is because it didn't kill you and there's no broken bones or bleeding, you must be fine.
And maybe, maybe, maybe you've done a standard x-ray, a standard CT, or even a standard MRI. These are looking for major disruptions, what are called grade two or grade three level injuries. That is when the ligament has completely torn and now things are free and mobile way, 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 way too much. Now that's obvious in that circumstance, but I would argue that the vast types of injuries are what are called grade one injuries. These you can see under the microscope. And what they are is they are derangements. They're tearing at a microscopic level of the tissue integrity. And the kicker is, is a lot of times these can still cause the exact same array of muscular, ligamentous, and neurological problems. But because they aren't near as big that when the radiologist looks at the report, they come back and say, nope, everything looks good. Why? Because they're looking for broken bones, dislocations, tumors, bleeds, all that sort of stuff. They're not looking for the super tiny things where the joints, the individual joints themselves, may be offset, injured. And that sets people up for functional neurological conditions of a wide variety. So this is the importance then of the cervical capsular ligaments. They are the structures that maintain the normal integrity of this system. They are what provide the normal motion. But if they're injured, even at a microscopic level, they then are what have the potential to be causing a whole bunch of problems. Now, the authors here, they talk about ligament laxity, so it's been injured and now it's moving too much. It can either occur from a single macro trauma, like a whiplash injury, or it can develop slowly as cumulative micro trauma, such as those from repetitive forward or bent head posture. You know, doing this all day. Or even going to school writing like this or sitting in front of a computer. You get the idea. We use the example and the analogy of a bow and an arrow, which normally would have a nice little curve like this. Well, you can either A, have a sudden injury which snaps that and it causes your neck to straighten out. Or B, you can just stick your head way too forward, far forward and what happens is that stretches out over a long period of time. Point being is that if you put any tissue in your body, whether it's a muscle, a ligament, or a nerve, under sufficient stress and strain, what it's going to do is it's going to deform and it's going to start to become excessively stretchy, moving too much. And when something is moving too much, it's not able to maintain the normal integrity and the structural stability that should have been there. And when it comes to the joints of the neck, it means that everything moving too much, it can start getting loose and sloppy. And when that happens, joints start getting loose and sloppy. A few things. Number one is they start to make abnormal little noises as they might click, crack, or flick past each other like this as you're moving your head. What they may also do is they may also, not unlike a uh, injury like you have a bruise, they can start to become inflamed. And guess what that's going to do? That's going to produce pain. But in addition to that is if you've got excessive motion of the vertebrae in your neck, particularly your C1 and your C2, then what happens is you don't have the normal integrity and so you're going to have more stress and strain that can potentially be impacting you here. Remember what we said, your brain sits here. It is actually tethered on the inside right there to that C1 and to that C2 vertebra. So if these start moving way too much, like a series of tension cables, they can actually start pulling and they can actually start irritating your spinal cord, your brain stem, or your brain itself. That is one of the reasons why neck pain is really associated with so many different kinds of symptoms. And over the course of this article then, they talk about a good chunk of these. I will not read it aloud for you again, but not only is it neck pain, but you can have vertigo, you can have dizziness, 
You can have brain fog. You can have full body pain. You can have neuralgias and radiating pain and tingling in other parts of your body that you don't think are even connected to your neck. And because your C1 and your C2 are directly in line with the master control center of your nervous system, your brainstem, your medulla, it can lead to other organ issues as well. Heart, lungs, digestive, reproductive system, just to name an example. The category of a, what we talk about is a dysautonomia or sometimes a postural or orthostatic tachycardia, very, very common. Now, as we've also talked about, a good chunk of the time, standard scans are not identifying these kinds of issues. And so, the authors, what they talk about later on in this article, they talk about in order to identify these things, they recommend what's called a digital motion x-ray. Point being, and what it is in a nutshell, it's an x-ray where you take it in flexion, you take it in extension, and you do it with your neck going into the different angles so that you can see not just the static position, but you can actually see if there's excessive amounts of mobility going on at the same time. Now, they don't talk about it in this article, but there's actually, there's another way that you can do it. And that's using not what's called a DMX, but what's called a DAX study, digital articular x-ray. And this can be done either using plain radiography or using what's called cone beam commuted tomography or a cone beam CT or CBCT. In brief, what are those kinds of images? Those are images that recognize that everybody's architecture is different on the outside and on the inside. Some people have very steep angles. Some people have very shallow angles. Most people are different on the left side and the right side of their body. So what it involves is it involves first a detailed look to find out what is your normal anatomy to see how your joints are supposed to fit together. And then you look to see what the underlying condition is so that that way you can identify, okay, hey, is the joint integrity, are the joints lining up, whether it's in your neck, your low back, your little probe, doesn't matter. They should line up. Or do you see evidence of disrelationship? So you can do it with the DMX, but you can also do it with these DAX kind of studies as well. And unfortunately, they didn't really talk too much about that in this article. So I wanted to let all of you guys know that. Now, in the course of this article, what they're talking about, they're talking about where the major culprit for neck pain and neck problems will actually go up, and I'm going to read it. Due to its lack of osseous stability, the upper cervical spine is vulnerable to injury by high-velocity manipulation. The capsule ligaments of the atlantoaxial joints are especially susceptible to injury from rotational thrusts and may be at risk during mechanically mediated manipulation. Okay, now this is actually saying something that what you would be never wanting to do, for example, if you're a chiropractor or maybe a physical therapist or an osteopath, depending what jurisdiction is you're in. What you don't want to do is you don't want to take the neck and you don't want to turn and you don't want to twist it. I completely agree with that statement. Why is that? The C1 and the C2 unit is responsible for doing 50% of all of your head rotation. It is also the only joint in your entire spine that actually provides that kind of pivot action. And the authors, they don't talk about this, but the C1 and the C2 is the universal compensation joint. So we've talked about if you've got an injury, however the injury happened, and that it's your neck that's most likely going to be injured in the process, either directly or indirectly. And if there is ever an injury to any part, namely the ligaments, the capsule ligaments that are providing the stability, and something gets stuck, say like this, the C1 and the C2, your brain is going to use that joint in order to produce a compensation, something like this or something like this. Let me repeat that because it's worth, well, let's not be redundant by being redundant. Sorry. 
the authors here, they talk about how C1 and C2 very, very commonly is an excessively lax joint. It's moving too much. And as a result, you don't want to be putting any more movement in there. But what I am arguing and what I want to let people know is C1, C2 is usually a compensation for something else. So no. Well, actually, yes, I completely agree with them that if it's a compensation, you don't want to be putting more force, more movement into it. Why? Because it's already moving way, way, way too much. And the authors, they make the particular case that that C1 and that C2 unit is actually the most likely source of pain that people experience, whether it's neck pain, headaches, migraines, vertigo, dizziness, or any of those other kinds of sensations. I completely agree with that. But where I disagree is where I disagree is why is that area under stress and strain in the first place? And what should you do about it? Now, a little bit later down in the article, and we'll come back around to that here, but I do want to highlight this little comment right here. It has to do with the body's intelligent way of providing stability if and when there's ever been an injury. And it's spondylosis, again, degenerative arthritis. Oh, wait a minute. I thought that degenerative arthritis was because you were getting older. No, that is a myth. Straight up, that's a myth. Yes, as you do get older, it's more likely that you're going to experience degenerative arthritis. But why? It's because that's how your body adapts to accumulative stresses. It is not simply because you are older. So for example, let's say that somehow or another, you're 40 years old, you've never had an injury in your life. If I was to examine your spine, I'm probably going to find it is in immaculate shape. If on the other hand, let's say that you're 20 years old, and when you were five, you were learning to bike, and you went way too fast down a hill, and you crashed into a tree, and you caused a significant injury. Let's also assume that your parents took you to the emergency room. They said, no, nope, no, nope, no broken bones. Everything must be fine. But the nature of that injury has then been accumulating unpaid compound interest, stress, for a further 15 years, even at 20 years old, that person will exhibit early signs of degenerative arthritis. So it's not a person's chronological age. It is the age of the underlying physical injury. And what the body actually does when you have these kinds of injuries, it means that the joints, the discs, the bones, everything is moving too much. And your brain knows that's bad. So what does it do? It lays down more bone and it changes its shape into spiky bits like this, what we call osteophytes. It lays down more bone and produces the degeneration as a mechanism to solidify the area. Because if it know or it knows, it's intelligent, it knows if you don't have that stability then everything's going to be moving way, way, way too much. And that is going to be a big, big problem. So this is a little bit of a side comment that I wanted to have for a moment right there because it addresses and answers that question, you know, what causes degenerative arthritis? Now, going back to the, the nature of the article and the question, okay, well, what do you do about it? So if you've got neck pain, if you've got headaches, if you've got any of these other kinds of issues and you're looking for long-term solutions, what do you do about it? Well, what the article or what the authors recommend is that, you know, you consider something like prolotherapy. And I will say in concept, I completely agree with that. They say we want to do digital motion x-rays and we want to identify first where are the actual joints and the levels of your neck that are moving too much? Because odds are that's what's producing your symptoms. And what we're going to do then is we're going to do a localized injection, which is going to cause and allow those ligaments to tighten. And for a large number of people, guess what? It works. Awesome. But I'm going to make an argument that the injury itself is not always what you need, or excuse me, the, the, the injection is not necessarily what you need 
because the injury is not necessarily what it seems. Do you remember what we said way back in the beginning? The, art, the authors were talking about when you have injuries, the injuries cause excessive mobility. But you remember that we talked about what was called a joint entrapment at the exact same time. Like if you've ever gotten your ankle caught and it doesn't quite move as well on the other side. Yeah, it's excessively mobile one way, but the other way, it's actually sticking. It's not moving appropriately at all. In fact, it's moving too little. And in particular, at least in my own experience, there are two joints in the neck that are most commonly involved where they are not moving enough. These ones seem to be particularly susceptible to joint entrapment, decreased motion. Where are they? Number one is the joint between the base of your skull and your C1 vertebra. So between here and here. The other one is between your C2 and your C3 vertebra. So this is the back side here and here. You'll note that we skipped one. We did not talk about C1 and C2. And it's because I agree with the authors. That area, very, very often, it doesn't lock. It doesn't get entrapped. On the other hand, it's moving way, 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 way too much. And it's probably susceptible to the strains. And yes, I completely agree, is most likely causing the symptoms that people experience. But why is it moving too much? Is it because it was directly injured or... Is it more likely that because you had a joint lock above or below, that your body has produced a compensation at that universal compensation joint like this, and that's what's actually produced the long-term stress? Now, if that's the case, you can have the injection, and it's going to help but guess what? It's going to restretch. Why? Because the brain needs that as part of its adaptive strategy. So, what you would actually need, in my opinion, at least what I'm proposing, is that you need to check to make sure that you actually have normal motion through all of the joints in your neck first. And that is where DAX studies are so useful. Again, whether digital articular x-ray or a cone beam CT, you see exactly how these things are lining up or not, and that tells you how you need to unlock them using the least amount of force possible, doing so so that you don't have to make corrections everywhere else in the spine, and so that you need as little treatment as possible so you're getting the best possible long-term results in the quickest period of time and for the longest lasting outcome. Now, if at that point in time, if at that point in time, you are certain that all of the bits and pieces, they are moving sufficiently, and yet you still have that excess laxity, that's when I would argue that a prolotherapy is the most important. Now, sometimes, yeah, you may want to get some stability to help out the rest of things as your body heals. But this then is where, and of course, I'm going to have my, you know, bias because it's, you know, what I am. I'm an upper cervical chiropractor. My focus is in the health, motion, the alignment, the integrity of this upper neck area. And so what am I going to say? Of course, I'm going to say you're going to look to make sure that this area is properly corrected. Now, in the same breath, I'm not going to say, oh, well, the adjustment's going to fix everything. No, 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 no. Ideally, those of us who are upper cervical chiropractors and those who work in musculoskeletal medicine providing prolotherapy to this area, we need to better understand what the difference between the two conditions is so that people get the best kind of outcome. Otherwise, you can unfortunately, you can have all the injections you want, but the underlying issue is still there. So that is still treating the effect. Same thing. We can be adjusting you, but if there still is ligament instability, you're going to need that solidified 
in order to resolve your underlying issue as well. My point being, for whatever reason it would be, I have had more people inquire to my practice about cervical instability, probably in the last year or two, than I did the preceding decade. And the question is, well, why is this? Where is this information coming from? And what's the difference? Because people, they're looking for a DMX study or they're looking for prolotherapy. It's like, okay, no, 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 no. That may not necessarily be what you actually need, at least at this point. So I want to clarify that, yes, you can have ligament laxity. But even ligament laxity can be the byproduct of something going on above or below, especially if it's at your C1 or your C2. It's not always straightforward, not always straightforward, simple. I absolutely wish that it was. I wish that it could just be let's snap of the fingers, boom, problem solved, everything is good to go forever and ever, amen. I wish that we could do that with an adjustment. I wish that we could do that with TMJ therapy or with dental work. I wish that we could do that with a prolotherapy injection, but the reality is, especially when people are suspecting something like a craniocervical instability, there's more to the story than meets the eye. It is usually not just that one magic thing that you need. What people usually need is they need the combination of these different people all working together. One, to make sure that you've got the proper motion in the places it should be. The other, making sure that you don't have too much motion in the places it shouldn't be. And then the last, making sure that the rest of the system is clear so that both of these are going to be allowed to calm down and settle the way that they are supposed to. So this, again, even though I don't necessarily agree with everything that the, the authors have put forth in this, uh, this particular research paper, I absolutely commend them. They have done a brilliant job on summarizing what the nature of the challenge and the problem for so many people who have neck pain, neck issues, headaches, vertigo, jaw issues, et cetera, et cetera. They've, they've described exactly what the underlying issue is is about why these people have slipped through the cracks so many times and places. But what they haven't quite said is they haven't said this is where their treatment approach fits, fits into the, uh, the big scheme of it all. Nevertheless, um, brilliant piece of, uh, brilliant piece of um, uh, research here. I only wish I'd been the one to actually put it uh, together. So I highly recommend that if you are experiencing some of these different symptoms we described, that you actually read uh, this paper in its entirety. It's written in plain English. It's very easy to understand, very, very well laid out, and definitely worth your time. Now, if not, in one way or another, I do hope that you've enjoyed this quote-unquote summary video of uh, this research. Per always, we'll give you a proper link in the notes here. And as we're wrapping up this video, we always ask you the three things at the end. Number one is if you have enjoyed it and want to get more information like this, please do click either or both the like and subscribe button. That helps YouTube identify this video so that it gets shared with more people who need to find this information. So that's number one. Number two is if you've got friends or family member where you're thinking, wow, they should probably check out this information, please share this with them. Last but not least, number three is if we've identified something in this or in this uh, video here, and you're thinking, okay, wow, that sounds like me. What I'd ask you to do is go to my website, which is going to be uppercervicalspokane.com, where we've got links to all kinds of other videos, all kinds of articles all the information that you need so that you can decide if this kind of plan and approach that we do in our office might be able to help you out. And if that's the case, you can get in contact with us. We've got two offices in uh, Spokane, one in the north, one in the south. Be happy to help you out in any capacity we can. Otherwise, you can go to blairchiropractic.com, find the doc who is nearest to you. As always, hope you guys have found this video informative, valuable, but also enjoyable at the same time. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic. Get well, live well, stay well. Take care. Bye-bye.